All right. Um, hi, everybody. Today we've got uh, Ben Postma from PSDR, and he's going to talk about deployables. So I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Okay. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, can you guys hear me all right? Is my audio decent enough? Sounds good. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, what I want to talk through today is uh, one of the research projects being done here at PSCR. Um, first of all, just in case there are folks who are not familiar, um, PSCR is the Public Safety Communications Research uh, Division underneath uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, NIST is an agency under the Department of Commerce, um, so we are all federal government researchers, um, and our charter um, over the past few years, anyway, since um, the uh, first night was enacted in uh, 2012, is basically to start looking at um, ways of using or implementing or delivering LTE networks in ways that make sense for public safety. Um, prior to that, we've been doing a lot of work in um, APCO 25, um, audio intelligibility, and, and things of that nature. And we still do that to a degree. Um, my group, however, is primarily focused on LTE technologies. Um, so within that, one of our primary sponsors is the Department of Homeland Security's um, Science and Technology Directorate. And what we're looking at under for them is ways of doing um, highly mobile deployed networks or, or deployed networks in general for public safety. And so the research project that I'm going to talk to you about today is what we call highly mobile deployed networks. And this is a way of taking deployed networks kind of into the future. Uh, what, you know, 10 to 20 years down the road, what a deployed public safety network might actually look like. Um, we just wrapped up a summit here last week, which I think a few of you at least were at, so I want to thank you for your attendance to that, and I hope it was beneficial for you. Uh, what I want to talk through is understanding what PSCR does as a research organization, kind of where we're looking and where we fit into the whole process of technology, technology development. Um, I want to kind of present the background on deployable systems, you know, what's in use today, why are they there, what are we doing with them, um, and with that, kind of talk through some of the work that we have done uh, specifically for our research. I want to talk through what the concept of a highly mobile deployed network is. So as we move from, you know, what's been there and what's out there today, what are we talking about when we talk about this next generation deployed network? I want to talk through our research areas. We've identified five target research areas within highly mobile deployed networks, so I want to, I want to highlight that and talk through those. Uh, I want to quickly hit on our focus and goals for fiscal year 18, so kind of our next year of uh, research, what we're looking at doing. And then I want to talk through our concept of the next generation deployable systems test bed, which is really a way for all the stakeholders, whether it's government agencies, public safety operators, um, academic researchers or industry partners, how we can all work together um, to start realizing this next generation deployable networks goal. If you go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a bit of a complex slide, so I'll leave it here for just a minute to kind of digest this. But if you look over to the right side of the slide on the x-axis, you see 10 plus years out. And what we're trying to do and what we're working on as an agency is to really start focusing that vision and the agenda for, you know, what kind of research is coming down, you know, more than a decade out. We're not so much interested in what today's implementations of these networks look like. Um, there are things that we are focused on, but our, our main research drive is, is what is, you know, still has to be realized. How do, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with industry as they're developing new technologies and how to start thinking about those from a public safety perspective. Um, rolling back towards the left, um, you see an area that's between five and ten years out that's industry research and development and academic and government research. And, and we're looking to do, this is where the majority of our work lies. Um, we want to work with other partners. We want to fund um, various um, academic organizations or industry organizations to do research with us. Um, and most of the work that we're doing is on these products that are, the concept works, the idea is out there, the need is out there, but the product doesn't actually exist. And that's, that's kind of the space that we live in. And then rolling back, you know, closer to the currently available vertical line, um, you see standards and process and development and things like that. And we do impact that. We do think of, but we do have input into the standards bodies. We do um, provide best practices. Um, that is one of our major outputs is, you know, how can we impact things like 3GPP as a standard and where are there important places to add things. Um, but if any of you have worked with standards bodies before, if you want something to become a standard, you know, in five to ten years, we've got to start that vision now. And so as we start thinking of these concepts and as we start putting together these ideas for ten years down the road, 
if it makes sense to make that a standard that goes into some overarching standards body, we need to start that process now. So that's, that's kind of what we do and where we're positioned as an organization. So like I said, everything that we're doing with this project is really five or more years out. We're putting together the pieces. We're getting the inputs from stakeholders. We're starting to understand what the art of the possible is and where we can drive the development of future technology. So if you'll go to the next slide. I want to pull up for just a second and talk through public safety's need for deployable systems. And I know a lot of you are first responders. A lot of you have been in this space for a very long time. And so you probably know better than anybody. But basically the idea is, you know, as we start transitioning over to a broadband communications network where all first responders are communicating on a single broadband network, there are going to be places where the infrastructure may not be there or the existing infrastructure may be overloaded. So since some scenarios could be a natural disaster where existing networks can no longer be used. And so we just experienced this in, in, in Puerto Rico and in um, Houston area where if there were networks standing, a lot of them are either congested or damaged by you know, man-made or natural disaster. It operates in congested areas where existing networks can be saturated. Um, so in a massive incident, whatever infrastructure could be there may be overloaded and a deployable can come in and help balance that. And then the third case is a remote and geographically isolated area without network access. So there's some areas in this country where it just doesn't make sense to build a fixed network due to the lack of population or the lack of recurring incidents, but it's still possible something could happen. There's also geographically diverse terrain. We operate in Boulder, Colorado, and just to the west of us, you know, is a, a huge space in the Rocky Mountains of, of terrain that's very diverse and geographically challenging. So to put a fixed terrestrial architecture in there that would cover the entire area would be extremely cost prohibitive. And so we can come up with deployable solutions as it's highly mobile networks and networks that basically move with the incident, move with responders to provide that coverage where it's not existing. One of our guiding principles is that the deployed solution must be fully interoperable. And so what we mean by that is as the National Public Safety Broadband Network rolls out or, or FirstNet rolls out, whatever deployed network we build has to be fully interoperable with that network. We are not trying to build a separate network. We are not trying to build a, a one-off, you know, standalone sort of system. We're trying to build a network that enables anybody who can connect to it to be able to communicate. And then if you can connect back to the public safety, the national public safety network, you can intercommunicate with that as well. And the next picture. So an overview of what a deployable system is. And so when we talk about a high-level deployed concept, um, there's a couple of different attributes. And a lot of these come from the NIFSTIC Working Group on Broadband Deployable Systems that wrapped up some months ago. Um, but basically they spent a a good deal of time talking through, you know, what defines a deployable system and what are the differences. And basically, what we've come up with through that is, you know, deployable systems often have the, often have the following attributes. They have single or multi-sector cells. They generally have self-contained power. And by their definition, they're generally portable. Whether that's on a truck or a trailer or whatever it is, um, they're designed to, to go into an area to be self-sufficient and to be able to move around fairly dynamically. We've settled on two primary classifications of deployable systems. There's the core-ready deployable systems, also known as a cell on wheels, and a lot of you may have heard the term COW. That's basically what this is. Effectively, it's an LTE radio access network only. It is just the ENODB in, in LTE speak, and basically what that means is you need a backhaul to a core for any network functionality. If you don't have backhaul with a COW, your system will not work. You will not be able to connect calls. You will not be able to authenticate devices. You will not be able to do anything with it if you don't have backhaul to a core. The other version of this system is a core-enabled deployable system, or a system on wheels, also known as a SOW. This generally includes the LTE radio access network and an evolved packet core. So it does have its own core. It does have a radio access network. So it could operate standalone without any backhaul. The only concern there is that if that's the case, you're only communicating with people within the coverage area of that SOW. Without backhaul, you're still not connecting to other networks, and you're still not connecting to other groups, and you're still not getting outside information. So if we go to the next slide. Some of the research that we've done to date in deployable systems is really focused on um, single cells on wheels and systems on wheels. One thing we've been doing is looking at how, to, how operations of a deployable system coexist with other um, systems. So as... As we go through this, we've looked at how, um, how systems can function, what their power consumption looks like, what their research draw is, how long it takes to deploy a system. Um, we've looked at from a, a cell on wheels perspective, if you have a satellite-based backhaul with extremely high latency, 
you know, we're talking, you know, hundreds of milliseconds of latency. And what are the effects on applications and how, do, how application developers can basically handle those? We've done a study of in-band interference, and so what this was basically was if you have a deployed system with lower power operating near the cell edge of a macro system that's fixed within band 14 is what we use for our research, um, but effectively within the same operational band, what are the effects of the overall capacity and cell edge? Um, and then with this, we've done a handful of real-world deployments. Last fall, we did an operation uh, with the Coast Guard in Boston Harbor. Um, and this past summer, we did an operation with the Sheriff's Department in Grant County, Washington. Um, where we're going with this research, though, is we're continuing to look at how these systems can start to coexist. If deployable systems become more and more common, and they become, more, and they become smaller uh, and easier to operate, we expect that there will be multiple of these systems out in a single environment. So we want to start looking at how to start bringing these systems together and, and not have an environment of, you know, N individual systems, but rather have an environment where N systems become one coherent system again. And so as things evolve into smaller form factor systems, as software-defined networking um, advances, as unmanned platforms such as small UAS advance, we can start developing this, this really rapidly deployed but highly optimized public safety network. If you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about what that actually means. Um, so next generation deployable network. As we use this term, it's important to understand what, how we're defining it. Um, another way to think of this is a, is a decentralized LTE system. So if you, a next generation deployed network is a LTE network, or, um, primarily for public safety, which is comprised of small form factor self-contained LTE networks. Um, it also contains application services, and the idea is that they're all independently capable, so a single one of these networks can provide applications and connectivity for the users within its group, but then we want to be able to interconnect with other systems of the same architecture and then also be able to interact with the National Public Safety Broadband Network, really to expand the coverage of the, the national network. There's a natural technology evolution happening, which is allowing us to develop more small, more um, reliable and available small cells. Uh, we can get, because of it can be smaller, we can do rapidly deployable systems. Um, we can use adaptive networking techniques. And basically the whole idea, if you look at the graphic on the bottom, where we are today and where we have been is on the left side, which is a, a very large-scale cell on wheels or system on wheels that's connecting a number of devices. And the important thing to note here is that it's one system in an area connecting whatever devices are in the coverage area. So if you provide as much output power as you can and as much processing power as you can, you can support fairly decent ranges, you know, many kilometers in some cases, with hundreds and hundreds of users in, from one system. And while that works well, we think that technology is emerging to develop this in a more, um, more deployable manner. As we move over to the right, you start to see now multiple systems, whether the UASs or, you know, vehicles or people with backpacks, and the idea is that each one of these is its own network. Each one of these has a core. Each one of these has a small cell. Each one of these has an application server and they all have some sort of backhaul connection to other units, so that when one unit deploys out, they have the network with them. When another unit comes on scene, they also have a network with them, and those two networks begin intercommunicating. And now a user from network one can have mobility over to the other network, they can share application services, and so on and so forth, until they eventually reach back to the public safety broadband network, and now they have connection to the rest of the world. And so that is a way to develop a very logistically light way of developing a coverage area basically that follows the incident. So in the first case, it's, it's logistically challenging. You have a big piece of equipment to move in. Once you put it up, it's generally there whether the incident moves or not. Where we're transitioning into is networks that become just part of the equipment set. It becomes part of the apparatus. It becomes part of the rollout. And wherever that responder team goes, the network is going with them, and it's really kind of an afterthought at this point. They turn it on, and it's just there, and it finds whatever systems are with them. So as people move around an incident, their network is naturally moving with them. And so that's the whole concept of gener a next generation network. And, and there's a lot of things to study within this to make this all work, especially as dynamic as we want it to be. One of the guiding principles that we have for this research is we want this to be completely reliable and robust and basically self-forming. And so what I mean by that is we don't want to take down a first responder that now has to focus away from their job and focus on develop, building this network and connecting this network and everything like that. We expect that these networks can operate themselves, basically. So when the first responders are there to do their primary role, the network just establishes itself, optimizes itself, moves data across the network by itself, and basically can do this all on its own without having somebody really think about it. So we go to the next slide. 
So like I said at the beginning of this, we hosted an HM, a highly mobile deployed network summit uh, here last week. It was a two-day summit with 85 participants from various countries, agencies, and companies. Um, and the idea was to identify current gaps which are preventing the realization of this concept that I just described. I gave out two use cases that basically summarized the needs, you know, a, a two use cases in which a network like this is very much needed. And we broke into five different groups based on what affiliation people had, what their, you know, what their focus is, what their expertise was, and things like that. And they all identified various gaps within these use cases. And then the next day, we, we basically took those gaps and started looking at end-to-end -end solutions, what's possible and what can we start developing to start solving some of these gaps. The last thing we did is we basically did a sticky note experiment where we basically put ideas on sticky notes and, and looked at how brainstormed ideas on how a combined test bed could be helpful. And so we're putting together all the data we collected on that. We collected a huge amount of data, and it was, it was, it was, I think it was a very productive meeting. And so we're putting that together. We'll release the report um, no later than November 17th. Okay, next slide. So to talk to some of the research areas, uh, I mentioned we broke this into five different areas. Um, the five things we're looking at doing, um, we're researching interconnection backhaul and vehicles. We're researching what we call resilient systems. We're researching security as it applies to deployed systems. Uh, we're looking at various LTE platforms and how those need to be modified or upgraded. Um, and we're looking at what kind of application sets and how to actually measure this information. Um, so to go through these one by one, if you go to the next slide, um, what we mean by interconnection backhaul and vehicles is basically we're looking at the transportation coordination and interconnection between each deployable network. Excuse me. Um, what we're looking at doing is basically how do these networks interconnect? How do they arrive? Do they integrate into you know, a vehicle? Do they integrate into an airborne platform? Once they do arrive on scene, how do they connect with each other? Um, we expect to use some sort of a mesh network connection, but we want it to be open source so that we're not you know, developing a vendor-specific network. Um, we want to be able to use an optimized topology for a full decentralized network concept so that if one unit is connected to another, um, connected to a third unit, there's end-to-end -end networking across those three systems or more. Um, and then we want to look at how can we use multiple independent networks and can, can coordinate those basically to provide the best coverage, connection, and service. So if all these networks basically have a full understanding of their RF environment, their users, their propagation, where their cell edge is, cell edges and everything like that, how can we take that data in and start either driving position changes or recommending to operators for position changes um, so that the network can be operated, optimized. And you know, finally, how can these networks move with the incident? So this research area is really all about that physical connection between these individual network nodes and how can we make that fully optimized. And the next area um, is LTE platforms. And what we're looking at with there is we're not trying to implement a different version of LTE. Uh, we expect that whatever is the standard for the public safety broadband network, whatever 3GPP release it is, or whatever is, is unique to that network to make it a public safety LTE network, we're going to leverage the same thing. But within LTE platforms, there has to be some considerations made for a deployed network. Consider that if there's two cores in an area, and those two cores are talking with one another, is there a way to synchronize certain databases within those cores, such as an HSS or a PCRF, um, so that they can share information so that now users can migrate or roam onto other networks that they've never been associated with before. It's a technique that we call ad hoc roaming. And it basically allows us to do a fully dynamic environment where operators from one agency can come in and connect to another agency's network with no prior coordination needed to allow this network to be fully dynamic. And we can also use things like this to be able to, to level load um, traffic across multiple agencies' devices. And while these controls are all put into place for you know, coordinated networks or networks of the same vendor, we're looking at doing this with dynamic networks that don't have the opportunity to be previously coordinated and maybe different vendors. Uh, the other thing we're looking at in this is um, LTE and the unlicensed band. We think that there's a really strong possibility that LTE and the unlicensed band, whether it's 3.5 um, CBRS band, 4.9 gigahertz, or 5 gigahertz, to be able to augment the existing public safety spectrum in certain cases. So we're looking into that. On the next area, which is security, I believe. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. The next area is resilient systems. Um, this basically focuses on the networking protocols and techniques 
used to move data across the highly mobile deployed network. So while the first interconnection and, and backhaul was to talk about the physical connections, the resilient systems piece really talks about the software and the intelligence that we build into the system to be able to move data across the network intelligently. We're looking at ways of doing, you know, moving beyond traditional IP-based networking and going to something, you know, more, you know, like content-centric networking or something that's a little bit more dynamic so that users can move around different networks and either retain their identities or get new identities, but basically can move around networks and still retain their data sessions. This way, we don't have any sort of loss of coverage or any loss of operational effectiveness when users move across different networks. Other things we're looking at doing is because we are going to be resource limited in a lot of these cases, we're not going to have unending amounts of backhaul. We're not going to have access to the cloud for applications. So we're looking at moving a lot of those applications to the edge, and we're also looking at ways of doing uh, fairly intelligent data synchronization and replication across the network. One use case for this would be if somebody shows up to a network with their own deployed system and they have content on it that the other units in the network want, is there a way to be able to push that out and replicate that across in a, in a secure yet resource effective manner? The next research area that we're looking at for this is, you go to the next slide, security. And basically, you know, security is key for any, any part of this whole national public safety broadband network or anything we're doing, but specifically within deployables. If, if we build security with, you know, centralized ICAM services or centralized authentic, authoriz, um, authentication services, that works really, really well until you get to the case where you're no longer in online mode. When you're completely decentralized and completely off the core network, how can we still ensure data integrity and that the right users get the right access to the right data? And so we're looking at ways of doing either an on-the-edge ICAM or a decentralized ICAM service or, or anything like that to be able to successfully authenticate users on a very secure network so that we don't inhibit anybody from doing their job, but we still don't expose sensitive data or information. If you go to the next slide, um, the last thing we're looking at is applications. And, and applications really are the most important part of everything we're doing with this. At the end of the day, what the public safety operator is going to be using is the application set. And, and how well they do that application set is how well, how effective they can be at their job. We understand that, you know, the network and how the network topology looks and all the different moving pieces that are kind of behind the scenes on this aren't really that relevant to what the first responder wants to do as long as the application is developed correctly. So we want the network to be basically transparent. And how we measure effectiveness of this network and how we measure effectiveness of the overall system is how well the user can interface with their application set. And so this really does look at end-to-end -end applications. How are we going to, what first responders going to need? How does a decentralized or deployed network operate differently than a centralized or, you know, nationwide type network? And how do applications need to be built differently? And how can we basically enable that full set of tools for operators no matter what state they're in? All right. Um, next slide. So. Given that those are what we're looking at, our, our overall goals for fiscal year 18, um, our ultimate goal is to start defining a highly mobile deployed network reference architecture. And one thing that came up continually during the summit we had last week is that because this has to be a standard, because people are going to be able to, an agency is going to be able to own and maintain their own deployable systems, we want to make sure that whatever they build out to and whatever they, whatever they operate and maintain um, is built to some standard. And so we want to start helping define that standard. And how we do that is a reference architecture. We basically say, here's what pieces should be there. Here's how this helps. Here's what works, what doesn't work. Um, here is how application developers can develop things for this architecture. And so underneath this reference architecture pro project is basically we need to research and development, develop how to build an open standard mesh network interconnection methodology. That's one of the biggest pieces that I think we're missing today is build that really reliable yet fully open standard mesh network interconnection system. Um, the other thing, another thing we want to do is be able to define the resilient networking component. So we, we understand this is going to mean something like content-centric networking. It may mean cognitive data synchronization and replication. Um, it may mean intelligent control over virtual machines. There's a lot of advancing technologies that can go into this, and we want to define what that looks like. Um, as I said before, one of the goals for next year is to start looking into how does LTE and the unlicensed interoperate with Band 14 and how can we make that work for us. We want to look for methods to provide dynamic access control and mobility. And then, like I said, we want to be, begin development of an application developer standard. So how to, what things, we want to be able to give an architecture to application developers so that we can start building out tools for this network. 
Those are all things that uh, my team and I are working on over the next year. Go to the next slide. Okay, and what I want to wrap up with and close out with today is kind of this concept of a test bed that we've been talking about for some time now. And basically what's happening is we are establishing a next generation deployables network test bed. And what that means is we are establishing an environment where stakeholders can experiment with concepts or demonstrate advancements in technology or basically do any sort of experimental pro project that helps define the future state of the network. Now, we're still working out exactly what that means, um, but my vision is that people can submit ideas for experiments that work with us and work with other vendors and work with other agencies, and we can also all basically come to the same place with resources provided by PSCR um, to start running through these experiments. And so the idea is that the experiments have to align with what my previously stated goals for this are, but primarily, at the very, very high level, they have to be able to provide some benefit to public safety. So I'm very interested in bringing in you know, various groups and start working together. And if groups have concepts, if groups have ideas, if groups have hardware or applications or process they want to start seeing implemented in this you know, very physical test bed, in this area, in this environment, I want to start bringing groups in. I want to start running through these experiments. Um, on the right side of the slide is kind of what the outputs are. And I'm not going to go through all those, uh, but really what we want to get out of this is um, we want to be able to input um, into the next generation first responder exercises that are done by DHS. Um, we want to have a better way to advertise or put out technology ideas or gas. Um, and really, we want to define metrology standards and standards and best practices. That's what we want to get out of at the end of the day. As we develop this reference architecture, we want to have metrology standards behind us so that we know how to measure one's success towards that standard architecture. And then the next slide shows basically here's an architecture, and this is a, you know kind of a busy slide, but. The architecture on the right side shows what we've already built, and we demonstrated this last week to a handful of um, people who were at the stakeholders or the um, summit. But basically, we have two different systems, fully standalone, fully deployable public safety systems um, with application servers and cores and small cells, and we have them interoperating together. We have the users on one system using application services from another system and back and forth. And basically, what this gives us is a very robust baseline for the next generation testbed. And so people can take this baseline and can start looking for places to inject their information or hardware or processes or ideas, and we can start looking and seeing what works and what doesn't. And so my goal is to be able to build off of something like this um, as we move on and start pushing experiments through and pushing ideas through. And if you go to the next slide, I believe it should be a, yeah, this is a kind of a picture of where the actual environment is. It's located north of our facility in, in rural Boulder, Colorado. If you look at the box that's on top of the van, that is a 6-inch by 8-inch by 8-inch box, which basically hosts one of our prototype deployable systems. That one's called the Airborne Deployable Research Platform. It was designed to go underneath small UAS, and that has an application server. That has an ENOB. That has a core. That is basically this architecture I've been talking about, and that's the first realization of it. And so we have other systems that have that same functional architecture that are a bit bigger, but we have those interconnecting. In fact, in this picture, this is actually talking to a mesh relay point, which is talking to another system which has functioned the same architecture to be able to share information and be able to share um, user groups across those two spaces. So that pretty much sums up what we're doing and where we're going with next generation deployables. You know, some final thoughts are this, this really does exist for, you know, the benefit of public safety. What we're doing, we understand that there will be gas in coverage. There's no way around that. Uh, and so we want to build deployable systems that are best suited to be able to with limited you know, logistics or limited resources to still be able to provide that full connectivity. Technology is emerging, and one of my goals for this research is to be able to stay close with commercial technology as new concepts and new ideas are being developed and start leveraging those for public safety. But the biggest thing, and the thing I want to leave everybody with, is the involvement of stakeholders, such as yourselves, such as academic groups, and such as other you know, organizations, is really critical to the advancement of anything like this. We don't want to do this in, in a vacuum. We don't want to do this, you know, just for the sake of looking into interesting science. We want to do this to really advance public safety communications, and that's where we need all the inputs from various user communities. So I appreciate your listening, and I guess I'd like to open it up for any questions at this time if we have, if we have time. Oh, yeah, you definitely have time, and so let's open it up for questions. Uh, ben, Barry Luke. Two, two, two quick questions. Uh, great, great presentation. As we are seeing... Uh, deployable uh, systems and uh, different types and, and the vision that uh, you're articulating in this research project, one of the issues that has come up 
is, is the seamless transition as, as first responders move from sort of network A or, or node A to node B to node C, what agencies find today as they use a, a different products like NetMotion is that there are these, these transitional gaps where the device senses that, 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 that the current attached network uh, is, is uh, absent or not responding and it pauses and then it switches you to the other network. As we look at, at this vision for uh, the, these mesh deployables, do you see that um, that transition uh, will get better and better to where the first responder won't even really notice with their voice, video, or data inquiries that, that they've transitioned? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's one of our main goals behind the whole resilient networking piece. And you, you did a really good job re defining kind of what we're looking at in that is that, you know, what happens today is you just open up a data session on their network, and their data session is based on a set of addresses that they're given from the network. And as they move to other networks, those addresses change and, and their identification changes. And so a lot of applications and a lot of systems require that you restart that data session. And that's when you notice that interruption that you described. We're looking at ways to go beyond the traditional method of looking at networking um, into doing, into making that no longer be a problem. We want to be able to have seamless transition across the network. And really, my end goal is that the operator doesn't know that they switched networks, doesn't even necessarily know whose network they're on, but, they're, but they, they get seamless data across an, an incident and that they get the kind of data they want no matter whose network it's physically sitting on. So that's absolutely one of our goals. Thanks. And, and then the, the second question, and you touched on this a little earlier. I just wanted to ask you to come back to it. Um, as we have seen in, in Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and, and certainly uh, in Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands, the, um, the amount of infrastructure that is damaged following a, a disaster, which, which would be similar so the wildland fires in California and, and certainly earthquakes and other items, there, there's this rush to, to rebuild infrastructure and for uh, service providers to, to bring in uh, cow bolts and, and, and those types of solutions. Do you see, uh, especially with this work that you are doing now, that, that the future of network recovery would be airborne, where you would just bring in a, a fleet of, of uh, UAS-type devices and and create this, this mesh and actually restart uh, uh, a wireless network immediately following a disaster? Yeah, absolutely, Barry. Um, that is, um, that's one of the big pushes of our, of our research is developing this all so they can be small enough form factor where they can be airborne. And one of the unique concepts that we're taking is, you know, the, infra, the, the functional architecture for a system that we've built to go on a UAS is identical as the functional architecture we built for a system that go on the back of a fire truck, for example. So they're all basically the same look and feel systems. They may be different form factors, but the functional architecture is all identical. Now, that being said, there's a huge amount that we can do, and we're partnered with some really, really strong um, UAS research agencies. But basically, there's a lot of work being done into mesh UASs on a small scale. We can bring that to a bigger scale. But as we start looking at developing this whole you know, spectrum-aware deployable network where basically it knows where its users are, it knows what its coverage is, it knows what the RF environment looks like. Imagine if that is on a UAS. Now that can start feeding information back into the control system of the UAS, and basically these aircraft now can be fully self-aware, for lack of a better term, and know where to go to provide the best coverage without an operator actually having to do that. And then you can easily extrapolate that to now swarms of these, where I think it's very feasible to envision a future that you know, has a number of these systems all kind of self-organizing and, and self-optimizing to cover an area. And then the next thing is, you know, as a first responder goes in, these, in, these, in, these, these equipment sets are going to be so small that you don't need a dedicated team of people to deliver a colt or a cow or anything like that. Basically, if, if somebody can wear a backpack or somebody's got a vehicle with a space the size of a loaf of bread, they can bring in the network with them. And so it just becomes an afterthought. Right. There's been a lot of uh, uh, discussion lately about you know public safety grade and hardening facilities and, and 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 no matter to what extent carriers harden facilities and first net harden sites, there will always be some type of overwhelming incident that will take it out. Right. So uh, so th this could really change uh, the whole conversation about resiliency and, and how we recover. So th thank you. Yeah, of course, Greg. Are there any other questions? Um, I have two questions. The first one is that um, isn't Google deploying 
loan, L O O N system in the disaster area now? What do you think yeah. you consider loan as one of the deployable, deployable systems? I think you could consider that absolutely. Um, what I understand with loon is it is providing, you know, basically an airborne RAN. So if you want to look at it as a, and again, this is what I understand. I don't know all the details. I'm not fully read into what they're doing right now, but I know what they had previously been doing. And basically, you know, they're still going back down to the central core, and they're still they're basically looking at it. It's like a multiple cell on wheels type of configuration, if you will. We're building, and so one of the other things with this research is that it's it's pretty much platform agnostic. We're not building it for a specific platform, but we're building it so it can go on any platform. So at the end of the day, you know, in the future, if an ideal like Google Loon becomes something that is more widely adopted, there's no reason why you know this kind of architecture could go on a Google Loon. And the benefit that this provides you is the ability to operate fully standalone. It's, it's got a core on it. It's got an application server on it. It's got data, data, data storage on it. Um, so you're really limiting the amount of backhaul you need. You know, backhaul is still important, whether it's over satellite or something like that, but we want to be able to transition network where it's not 100% of the data on the network goes across the backhaul. It's a small percentage of that for the real-time information, but most of the processing can handle at the edge. And I'm not I'm not sure that with what Luna's delivered, um, if they've done it that way or not. Got it. Another question is that how did you make, mitigate a threat from the rogue base station? The rule can can pretend as a uh, deployable system, right, out there, mm-hmm. and lure the uh, public uh, safety user to attach to it. Then how did you mitigate that threat? So basically, you're asking about being able to control access from a a bad actor, basically. Yes. Yeah, that's one of the things we're looking at from a security standpoint. You know, obviously, we want to be able to give the right people access without having a single online system, because those can break or the connection to that can break. So we want to have that fully decentralized, but we also need to make it secure enough so that it can't be interfered with with any, with any um, nefarious users. So I don't have an answer on that, but it's certainly one of our topics that we're looking into. I mean, that, that's a big concern. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Ben. Yeah. Uh, li- likewise, this is Michael Britt. Um, likewise, once, once uh, multiple, let's call it organizations or multiple networks are meshed together. On the application side, if the application uses uh, an HSS, which SS, HSS wins, so to speak? I mean, if, if we're looking at uh, detailed information on users on the situational awareness app, how, how are you managing that side of the, the equation in terms of I mean, it, it follows along the same lines as the security issue. Who who has final authority? Right, and so we've we've tossed around a lot of ideas. You know, whether we have one system, you know, request that all of the systems in the network synchronized, and that one becomes the priority. Um, if we replicate timed data, so basically, you know, two agencies replicate their their HSSs with one another and then the incident's over and they all leave and go back home, does that data time out and therefore is no longer accessible um, to protect it? We've looked at a lot of different ideas, and we've talked through a lot of concepts with LTE manufacturers, but again, you know, we are not at the place where we have a solution for any of that. Um, but that is that is absolutely one of the things that's described in the use cases. Okay. And so it, it's, it's one of the things we're looking at. And unfortunately, you know, that's going to be the answer for a lot of these things is that because we're we're putting together this research over this last part of this year, and we're getting all the inputs from the stakeholders, we're trying to understand exactly where we want to start focusing, and that is one of the big ones: is how does how do the applications start to know what data to read? How do they get the right data, and how do we keep all that secure? Right. So. So, so you're collecting a, a list of issues. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's a growing list, but yes, it's, it's one of these things. We start opening this up a little bit; it gets to be. We've really got to decide what we focus on, and, you know, I can tell you that's definitely one of the things initially, but, again, as this grows, too, this is something I perceive as, as not being purely done by PSCR. We just simply don't have the resources to do something of this magnitude, and I don't think we should. Uh, we can certainly lead it and help orchestrate this research, but this really has to be a collective thing done by, by all the stakeholders. Yeah, and, and it does, I mean, that way it has, it has to grow into a standard. It's agreed upon by everybody. Right. I think that is the best way to do it. If there, there, and I don't know where you put the standard or what you can call it, but if there's some way to do that, you know, to define that reference architecture, if you want to have a deployable system, here's what it must be able to do, and then wrap that in some certification process somewhere, 
so that if you want to get access to the spectrum or you want to interconnect with other systems, you must meet these criteria, and then they all sort of do the same thing. And we, and we want to build that a standard. We want to make sure that stays open. Um, you know, like I said before, there's a lot of vendor solutions to some of these gaps, a lot of over-the-top application sets that all work if you have all the same company's hardware. And that's interesting because it shows that it's possible, but we want to break away from that. We don't want to have stovepipe systems that require the same, you know, my company A can't talk to your company B deployable is the last thing we want to have happen in this whole network. So. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, this is Arnav Mandy. Um, uh, I had a question about uh, the backhaul. You never mentioned about a satellite backhaul, at least on a selective basis, for the possibility of, uh, you know, one time query into a centralized HSS or a distributed HSS. Has that been considered? Absolutely. One thing I don't want to – I think satellite backhaul is very key. I think that – the common approach to satellite communications is, is a little bit outdated in that, you know, satellites are getting, satellite-based data is getting faster and cheaper, you know, by the day, like everything. And satellite terminals and antennas are easier and easier to deploy and point. Um, so it becomes less of a logistical and cost challenge to actually have a satellite-equipped system. And so ideally, you know, all, every deployable um, system has a satellite backhaul that works 100% of the time and can synchronize with, you know, whatever you know, nationwide HSS or nationwide ICAM server or nationwide, you know, you pick it. Um, so it's fully synchronized at all times, and that would be, would be the ideal. However, and I'm sure a lot of us have been around this for a very long time, we know that there's going to be one day where that doesn't work. And on that day, we need to have some sort of method to do this dynamically without mm -hmm. the need for backhaul. When somebody shows up to an incident and they're, they forgot to register their SIM, but they're a critical responder, how can we provide a dynamic interface to give them control? And that's what we want to look at. So... Not that we're writing out satellite as an option. I think it's absolutely a very needed asset for some units to be able to have, but we want to look to develop systems which consider you don't have that. And if you have it, it's only a bonus. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I guess satellite will, in most cases, be considered as a backup rather than a main uh, access, main backup. Well, yeah, and I think that may even be a, a different way of looking at it. I mean, the backup of priority comms, you know, indicates that there's one dedicated comms path. I think that if we have the, the primary communications happen at the edge of the network, where the most, the majority of applications you're accessing live at the edge, the majority of the users are at the edge, and they can all intercommunicate, and then, so that's you know, the way of communicating user to user, and then when data does have to go back, then it goes over satellite. So it doesn't, it's not really a primary and a backup or a failover, it's more of a, they all kind of work together. Right, right. Different levels yeah, yeah. of service. Okay. Thank you. So, hey, quick question, Ben. Uh, this is Tufik from, from Nokia. Yeah. How, yeah. Do you get, how do you get the, uh, the vendors involved? I mean, there used to be the, the CRADA program, um, you know, yeah. in the days of AMOL and all that stuff. Is that the same thing? Is that, is that like a CRADA thing? Or? So we have moved away from, so there used to be a very large-scale broadband consortium CRADA um, that, ven that many, many vendors had established with NIST. Um, it was very broad and very wide open. And with that, 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 well, it worked for what we were doing. Now that we're doing more focused research and even giving out grants and prizes and other funding opportunities, that limits a lot of companies. Um, so what we're doing is if we want to establish a creator with a company, um, we still very much can, can and do do that, um, but it's very focused. You know, it's set for a shorter term. It's very specific. Here's what we're going to provide. Here's what we're going to benefit. Here's how both parties are going to benefit from this. So, yes, we do that. We also have more, um, um, I guess, less stringent agreements. We've done technology agreements with other partners. We've done various um, software license agreements, um, non-disclosure agreements, other things that we can start working with groups on based on what they want to do. And, Tupac, I'm glad you bring this up because this is an important thing I meant, failed to mention. We're launching a deployables website underneath PSCR.gov within the next few days, and that is in my, it's my intent to have that be a fully, fully interactive community board where there's, you know, discussion forums and news feeds and things like that. But there's also going to be a resources place where if you want to be involved as a corporation, you know, how can you do that? You know, there's ideas where you can submit, you know, various proposals and things like that. So we absolutely want to continue working with industry. I mean, there's no way that, like I said, we're going to do this on our own. And, you know, again, we're not going to develop a system that, or a concept 
that nobody in the industry sees as a viable market because it's never going to get built. So we want to make sure that partnership is there. And I guess to say that is, there's a lot of different ways to think about that. But just in the, in the next few weeks, you know, go look at the deployables page on the PSCR.gov, and there's definitely a lot of these resources there. Okay, we'll do. Hey, uh, quick question. Um, in the research areas you've, you've, you've mentioned, um, yep. although you've talked a lot about the, the uh, the airborne stuff, and, uh, and Barry made reference to this. Is airborne deployable one of the five key areas? or? Yes, that goes underneath that first area of platforms. Okay, um, so. So, so airborne deployable systems are under platforms, and we, we do have two um, airborne assets, um, and we're working with other partners who, who do nothing but um, very high-end UAS systems um, to, to bring these into the air. So that is very much a big priority of ours, but that is wrapped underneath that first area of interconnection back on and vehicles, I think it was called. And do you plan do you plan to produce or to develop guidelines for the, the example you gave of a swarm of deployables? I mean, when you have a swarm, swarm of deployables, each deployable belongs to an agency. Every yeah. agency comes with the, with the controller. Uh, how many controllers would, uh, unless, unless all the drones, the, the drone system is autonomous, Every controller is going to control his own drone, and are you going to provide guidance or guidelines on coordination? Yeah, so for that and for other things like this, um, we certainly could. However, my team and PSCR in general is fairly small and resource constrained, I so I want yeah. us, my team to focus on the networking piece and the LTE portion and how this impacts public safety. And for something like you just mentioned, there are a handful of companies or consulting firms or agencies that are really, really well suited to look into, you know, the policy of operating multiple SUAS with different agencies and how you would do that. Um, and so that's an example of something that we would put together as whether it's a, you know, a grant or a prize or a, some sort of funded research to be able to go out and do the investigation and find out, you know, what the best thing to do there is. And the output of that could be, you know, as simple as a, a study or a white paper or something like that. But Basically, we would we would send that out to a third party to look at that. Uh, and so, on that, in the next few months, we're looking at things just like that to see, you know, what basically we need to farm out. And so, there's agencies that are interested in looking at things like that. We'll put up, you know, a request for uh, proposal on some of these things, and basically just see see if there's anybody interested in, in identifying some of those problems, because there are agencies that are suited to do those things than we are. Right. So, so I think. Michael, maybe this is something we should add to that UAS uh, report. I mean, how would you, how would you do UTM or uh, traffic management if you want uh, when you have multiple drones, each belonging to a distant public safety agency? Uh, I'm not saying we should come up with a solution, but at least uh, highlight it. I, I think you're right. I think it's at the point where we we highlight the issue and yeah. um, make sure that uh, put whatever public safety requirements would go along with that to help guide it, but I don't see us, like Ben says, <clears throat> I don't see us solving the issue without uh, getting input from from the experts, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're, we're at the uh, end of the hour. Are there any last minute questions for Ben? So if anybody thinks of anything, um, you know, I think my email address is available. Just please shoot me an email or, or you know, call. We can certainly talk about things. And like I said, in a few weeks, the, the deployables page will be live, and there'll be a lot more information on that there. And just kind of follow that if you like. So, excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Ben. This has been uh, really good information, and I, I'm glad to see PSCR taking this on. It's it's definitely. I mean, as as we saw with uh, Hurricane Harvey and the. Uh, sure number of UAS uh, communications platform that were put into use real time that uh, this is coming coming our way for sure